what she's supposed to be drinking. And uh, she doesn't like it when you change the bedtime routine. She knows exactly what's supposed to happen before she goes to sleep. She doesn't like it even sometimes when you change her nappy. She will tell you when she wants it changed. And uh, Melanie, the only change she likes is a change that she can control. And uh, maybe you can relate to that. I know I definitely can. And Melanie, she will pout. She'll throw a temper tantrum. She'll whine when uh, things are not going her way. Uh, she'll just act like a baby, like she, you know, because she is one. And what, we, what we've looked at as we've been looking through the Gospel of Mark is big changes are happening, aren't they, in Israel? Big changes are happening. And the Pharisees, the religious elite, they're actively resisting the change that Jesus is bringing. Uh, and they're challenging Jesus. They're, they're fussing. Uh, and many times the things that we can't change, they're designed to change us. And the Pharisees over the centuries, they had tried to change God to be some kind of caricature of something he wasn't. Uh, they didn't really show all of God's character, who God really was to people. And, and they even tried to change his words. They tried to add uh, extra things to God's words. And what Jesus wanted to do is he didn't want them to try to change him or change God's word or change God. He wanted to change them. And they were resisting that. Uh, despite their best efforts, Jesus, we know, is going to succeed. He's going to bring change. Uh, he's going to bring radical change everywhere. You see, people, as we've been looking through the Gospel Mark, they're experiencing radical changes. Uh, people that uh, they're hearing and experiencing things they've never heard before. Uh, he's changing everyday fishermen, and he says, I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. He's helping diseased people be healed of their diseases. He's helping crippled people be able to walk. He's changing people with this authoritative new teaching that they never heard someone teach like this before. Uh, he, he is uh, changing people's hearts. He's forgiving people's sins. And we, know, we heard last week, Jesus, he is a friend of sinners, of the tax collectors and people like that. And there's loads of people, man, if I was one of them, I would be very glad for it. There's lots of people, they are rooting, they're happy that Jesus is bringing about some changes. If you're physically healed, you'll be happy about that. Um, if you are a tax collector uh, or some other kind of person and Jesus is befriending you and he's saying you can have a relationship with God, I mean, you're going to be happy about that. Uh, but the Pharisees, they don't like it. The religious elite, they do not like it. And what we're going to read this morning in Mark chapter 2 and 3, they challenge Jesus five different times. We're going to look at a few of the challenges this morning. Uh, and I want you to notice the spiritual changes that God wants to bring in, in our lives, in our hearts, in our, in our community. What Jesus, the changes that Jesus wanted to bring to these people here. It's the same kind of changes Jesus wants to bring today. So let's go ahead and we're going to read uh, the, these verses one more time. And we're going to pray and we'll jump in and we'll see what God has for us today. So in Mark chapter 2. Uh, in verse 18, it tells us, And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine in old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled. And the bottles will be marred, but the new wine must be put into new bottles. And it came to pass that when through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto them, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and he was a hungered? He and they that were with him. How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which are with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. 
Uh, let's pray, and uh, we'll, we'll apply, have God apply this to our hearts this morning. Lord Jesus, again, we come before you, and uh, we're just thankful to see the real you in Scripture. Lord, so oftentimes our, our minds and hearts, we just don't see you clearly because we're not spending time with you. Um, maybe, Lord, it's we want to make you into something you're not, but Lord, you're, you're so beautiful. The God we see, the Jesus we see, is so balanced, you're so just, you're so graceful, you're so righteous, and Lord, we're we, we are thankful that you reveal our, yourself to us, that you let us in on these stories, that we can see the real you. And uh, Lord, I just pray for us this morning. Lord, I know that uh, you're still working on me as the kids song goes. And Lord, there, you're, you're still want to work. If there's the believers that are here, um, you're working on them. And so Lord, we just want to invite you uh, to use your power to change us to be who we need to be. But Lord, I pray for those, uh, maybe there's those that are uh, watching or maybe even here and they haven't trusted in you alone. There's maybe something that's holding them back. Lord, I pray that they could see the beautiful change that you want to bring. They, and they would experience it personally for themselves. Lord, we say all these things in Jesus' name. And Lord, we also want to pray for our families. Um, Lord, many of us, we have uh, families that, uh, that aren't, that we just desire for your favor in their life. We desire for them to know you better. Um, Lord, we think about um, Ian and Paul. Uh, Lord, we pray that for your hand of protection on them, that you give them uh, your safety and your grace. Lord, we pray for Jonathan, that you would bless him and guide him and keep him safe and bless his uh, his work ethic. And Lord, we even want to bring again, we, we, forget, we forgot to pray uh, just about this new opportunity uh, to be moving. Um, and Lord, I just pray that if this be your will, that you would continue opening the doors for us uh, to make that a reality. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters um, that are sick or that are working, uh, that you would strengthen them uh, and guide them today. We say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're going to see the change, the powerful change that Jesus uh, wants to bring. And, you know, the first change that Jesus wanted to bring to Israel, to these Pharisees, to these religious elite, is Jesus, he, it is the same change he wants for us, is he does not want us to follow ritualistic rules. Jesus wants a real living relationship. And we see that in verses uh, 18 to 20. The first challenge that these religious elite uh, have for him is they say, hey, what about fasting? Uh, you know, this religious practice, they kind of wore it on their sleeve as this symbol of how they were very spiritual. They were very holy, uh, and it was very outward for them. And they say, hey, why don't your disciples fast like us? And, you know, it just so happens they asked this question. Remember last week, the verses before this, what is Jesus and his disciples doing? They're eating, they're feasting with publicans, with tax collectors, with sinners, they said. And they're like, man, you guys are doing all that, but... What about fasting? What about that? And uh, so everyone, you know, we've, we've heard of fasting, haven't we? And many times when you think about fasting, you might think about intermittent fasting. And uh, intermittent fasting, man, that's like torture, slow torture, you know. But maybe you can lose a stone or two. You know, you're trying to aggressively lose some weight. Uh, and so you might decide to fast uh, for that. Some of you, yeah, it's, it's definitely by force. Uh, maybe your doctor says, hey, I'm going to do this medical procedure and you're not allowed to eat or you're only able to eat these certain things and drink these certain things and and so we fast for that but biblical fasting it was when you would abstain from food uh, for a spiritual purpose for a spiritual reason and we know that God is not against fasting in fact when we look at the verses God says hey they're not fasting now but the time will come when they do fast so God's not against fasting but he wa he wants us to do it for the right reasons uh, in, in the right way. And so what were reasons that people would fast in the Old Testament? And we know one is God commanded it, didn't he? Uh, if you were to look in Leviticus chapter 16, God talks about something called the Day of Atonement. It was a special day that the Jews would celebrate. Uh, and he said on this special day of atonement, he said, I want you to 
uh, afflict yourself, or in other words, fast. And he gave some guidelines for that. So it was just one day God commanded it. And what would happen is the high priest, he would go to the temple, he would go to the Holy of Holies where God's presence was, the most special place of the temple, and he would take the blood of that sacrifice goat and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat and that would symbolize the forgiveness of their national sin. And so the people before this, as a symbol of their humility, as a symbol of them accepting the forgiveness of sin, is they would fast on this one day a year. Uh, but we also know fasting was used to express. It, it, it was not mandated. God didn't command it. But people would fast when they were grieving. Maybe you can relate. If you've ever had grief, maybe you, didn't, you weren't even planning on fasting, but you just felt like, man, I can't even eat. I feel sick to my stomach. And there are several times in Scripture we think about David uh, and the mighty men, and they hear that King Saul, he's, he's died, and Jonathan, his son, has died, and the army of Israel has been destroyed, and they weep and they fast. So we know it was done when tragedy happened or out of grief. But we also know fasting was used, we see a lot, for the repentance of sin. Uh, in Jonah, you remember Jonah, he gets swallowed by the well, he gets vomited back up in Nineveh, and what does he, he goes, tells Nineveh uh, people, he says, hey, listen, you guys, God is going to destroy Nineveh because of your injustice, because of your, your sin. And what do the people do? They cry out to God in repentance. They turn their hearts to God and they fast, they pray, and uh, God forgives the people of Nineveh. And so we see these examples, but were the, is this why the Pharisees are mipped with the disciples? Is that why? Well, no. That, this wasn't the fasting that they were accusing his disciples of not practicing. Ironically, the, the Pharisees, they would fast for a very specific reason. They believed it was their job, it was their responsibility to usher in the Messiah. They said, man, all over the Old Testament, we see that God says the Messiah is going to come, the promised one that's going to save us. Uh, and he's going to set up this political kingdom and he's going to get rid of our enemies and all these different things. And they said, but it's not happening because we're sinners, because we're not following God's commands. So they said, what we need to do to usher in the Messiah's coming is we need to add more rules to what God says. So it's like, well, people can't follow what God said, so we're going to even add more stuff. That's what they did. And one of the things they said, to really show we're repentant, to really show that we're humble, we're going to fast two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. So they would ritualistically they made this rule and they said, we need to fast two days a week if we're ever going to see the Messiah come. What's ironic is Jesus is standing right in front of them, the Messiah. But you see, they couldn't change him to be what they wanted him to be. So their fast really, it may have started off humbly, but it became this monstrous act of pride. It became this uh, outward attempt to be seen of men. Jesus says, man, you guys are hypocrites. In Luke uh, chapter 18, uh, Jesus, he spake a parable. Uh, he told a story, an analogy to the, to, uh, and he says, uh, uh, there, and to certain which trusted in themselves, that was the Pharisees, they didn't rely on God or Jesus. Uh, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous, that they could be good enough, and they despised others. Two men went into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. Are extortioners and just, adulterers, or even as this publican, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So this was the spirit behind their question. This was their attitude, this self-righteous, arrogant attitude that they're having towards Jesus and his disciples. And so verse 19 and 20, Jesus answers them. And Jesus, he liked to answer people very simply. He, he liked to give something that people could hang their hat on. They could really understand. So he gives them a story. Uh, and why should they fast? And Jesus talks about this wedding feast. He talks about the bridegroom. He talks about this, uh, th this wedding party. And, he said, and Jesus is trying to tell them, he says, I'm the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom. I'm the groom. And they're celebrating at my wedding party, at my wedding feast, and they're expressing joy. As long as the bridegroom is here, as long as the bridegroom is with the bride, they're having joy. They're not going to fast during this time. It's not always going to be like this. 
uh, this is a very special time he's telling them in verse 19 and 20. And could you imagine, I know some of us, uh, can you imagine your wedding? And maybe you didn't have a traditional wedding in the sense that you had all the food, but maybe you did. You had one of those big old weddings and you spent a million pounds, you know, no. But, but you spent way too much money on it and you had the food and you had all that. Can you imagine people come and they refuse? They're just like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to eat. And you're like, this costs like 10 pounds a head. Like, oh my goodness. And they're not eating the food. They won't eat. Wouldn't that just drive you up a wall? And then the people, they're not celebrating. They don't, they're just kind of like, they're not smiling. They're just kind of there. And it's like, does anybody object? And it's like, they don't say anything but their faces. It looks like they don't want to be there. They don't want you to get married. And they're just upset. You know, and that's kind of the Pharisees in this story. And so Jesus is telling them, he's like, He's like, why are they going to, to fast? I am with them. I'm presently with them. They have everything they need. The wedding feast was the most joyous occasion for the Jews. They didn't have a honeymoon. And their wedding feast would last one week. And they, in that one week, the Sabbath would happen on that week. And the Pharisees, all their rules they would put on the Sabbath, they also made a rule. They said, hey, you have to follow all these rules except... If you're part of a wedding feast, if you're part of a wedding party, then you don't have to follow the Sabbath rules. Uh, some of the other extra rules we have, you don't have to follow it that week because we don't want anything. We want you to celebrate and have joy with that couple. And so they were exempt from that. So Jesus has given them something they can really understand because the time is going to come when Jesus' disciples, he says, they are going to fast. There's, there is going to come a time when they do, when I die, when I'm not physically present with them. But Jesus' presence with his disciples makes fasting not make much sense, is Jesus trying to tell them. Fasting, it makes sense in a world where it's broken with sin, we're separated from God. But Jesus, he's come. He's come to fix what was broken. He's come to bring uh, us out of the darkness and into the light. Uh, he's come to give us a life, and he's changing everything. Because in Jesus' presence, every need these disciples had was met when they were in Jesus' presence. It was a joyful time that they got to witness Jesus bringing into his kingdom. And something that we have a privilege of today, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, is we're part of the bride of Christ. And Jesus is saying, he says, hey, uh, uh, in Ephesians uh, 5, it's very evident that Jesus wants a very personal relationship with us. He doesn't just want us to mindlessly follow a bunch of ritualistic rules. He wants a real personal relationship uh, and he not only died for the bride, he loves the bride, the Bible says, and we should be the most joyful people on earth. I have to say that. Believers that know Christ personally, have a relationship with Jesus personally, man, we should have the joy in our life. Uh, Ephesians says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 1611. It says, thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At that right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And Jesus is saying, hey, they have joy. They're in my presence. They're able to experience uh, this new life I'm bringing. And some people think that uh, as a Christian, that church should be like going to a wake. Have you ever been to church and it's like, man, it's like I'm at a wake, you know, who died? Like, it's like, man, is Jesus alive or is he not? And some people think, man, you should look, the, the more you look like someone spit in your tea, the more spiritual you are, you know? And, and this is not what Jesus wanted, wants for us. It's not what he wanted for uh, his disciples. The, the Pharisees, they, were, they believed the more solemn you were, the more serious you were, the holier you were. They would wear all black. They would wear black clothes. They would even put ashes on their skin to make their skin look sickly. Uh, they wouldn't wash for days, uh, for, for weeks. Uh, they would kind of try to be look disheveled. They thought the worse you looked, the more spiritual you were. Uh, the less you smiled, the holier you were. And it's unfortunate sometimes when I talk to people and they hear um, about, uh, they may not even hear what I do. They might just know, okay, this guy is a Christian. And usually either they don't say anything or, they, or typically they say something like this, oh, good for you. And what they mean, they say good for you, but their facial expression is like, oh, man, I am so sorry for you. You will have no fun ever. Your life will be miserable. You know, their face is kind of drops. So it's like, oh, 
man, this guy, and uh, sorry. But man, believers, we should be characterized by faith, not fear, by hope, by joy, by the new life Jesus brings. And so we see that Jesus, he really, just like Jesus, he died for the bride. He loves the bride. He wants a personal relationship where we're relying on him. We're trusting in him and not us just to follow a bunch of ritualistic rules. But I want you to see, secondly, this morning, Jesus does not just want you, he does not just want to reform your life. That's not what he's about. He wants to give you a brand new life. He wants to give you and I, he doesn't just want to reform our heart. He wants to give us a new heart. He doesn't just want to reform our mind. He wants to give us a new mind. So in verse 21 and 22, Jesus answers. He, he talks about an old cloth, an old garment. Then he talks about um, these old wineskins and the new wine. And Jesus, what he's trying to tell them in these parables or these illustrations, these analogies that he's going to give them to illustrate this point, that he doesn't want to reform them. He wants to give them a new life. Is He's telling them, you can't take the change that I'm bringing and just patch it over your, your old religious traditions. That's not how this is going to work. And Jesus is calling us, he's calling them to newness and newness of life. So the radical change that he wants to bring, he, 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 he compares two things. He compares something that's very old and weak and brittle and uh, inflexible. And then he compares something that's new and fresh uh, in two different stories. And oftentimes when the old and the new come together, there can be fireworks, huh? There can be sparks. And so Jesus, he first talks about an old garment. Uh, you know, have you ever had like a favorite piece of clothing? Uh, maybe it's a football top, maybe it's something else. And uh, you've had it for a long time. My wife knows I have some things in my closet. And she's like, how long have you had that? I'm like, since I was 13. And she's like, disgusting, you know. And she's like, she hates it when I wear it. So I wear it to like cut the grass, you know, do the garden work. And so she, you know, we all have garments like that. And sometimes, like sometimes if I've had to be away a few days and I come back home, I'm like, where is that? So, oh, I took it to the, to the charity shop. But anyways, sometimes you just want to hold on to the old garments. You know, we, we, we have this uh, sentimental value or, or attachment to it. And uh, we don't do this as much anymore. But back then, what would you, what would you do if you had something that uh, tore and you wanted to keep it? You would try to put a patch over it. Uh, you would try to preserve that and keep it going to make it last longer. And especially when you have cotton, when you wash cotton, it shrinks. And if you put a new patch of cotton in an old cotton garment on a tear, on a rip, uh, when you do that, eventually when you wash it, that new patch is going to shrink and it's going to pull away from the threads, from the, sew the sewing that you did. And it's going to make the hole, the, 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 uh, the tear even worse. It's going to make the garment even more damaged as it pulls away. And so Jesus is trying to help them understand a very, he wants us to understand this morning, a very, very important central truth. The new fabric of faith in Jesus Christ, it cannot be interwoven with these fragile old rags of an old religious system. And so it makes me think of, I got married in 2017, um, and in my wedding, uh, Michael, he is my oldest brother-in-law. He's Bethany's oldest brother. He was supposed to be one of the groomsmen, and uh, like most weddings, you know, we had different outfits for the bridesmaids and the groomsmen, and uh, about it, about six months before the wedding, we said, okay, this is, this is the online link. This is what you need to wear. This is what you're going to have, uh, and it was like some kind of blue a suit type thing, and uh, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, great. Even Michael says, okay, sounds good. And we said, hey, if you can't afford it, you know, let us know. We'll help you. This is what we want everybody to wear. And so um, eventually it's like two weeks before the wedding, and Bethany checks. And Michael's like, no, I'm not getting it. And she's like, what? You know, her big brother. And he's like, no, 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 I have an old, old. I'll just wear that. But he's like, send me. No, you're not. He's like, no, no. I said, well, just have him send us a picture. So he sent a picture, and I thought it looked male. Maybe it might look might be okay. She's like, no, no, that is totally off the color. 
So he comes and he actually shows us, and it was very off. It's like the sky blue. Let me just say this. At the wedding, people wouldn't have been looking at the bride. They would have been looking at him. You know, he would have stood out. And so Michael were like, Michael, can you – actually, that store, the online, they actually have one here in our city. How about you go there and go get it? Uh, and he's like, no, yeah, I don't really have time, you know, and all this stuff. So he, he did it. So he said, okay, Michael, you can be an usher. You can wear that. You can be a head usher, whatever, but you cannot be a groomsman, you know. And uh, we're, by the way, we get on very well. They visited us last year. So uh, oftentimes that's how it is, isn't it, though, when it comes to faith in Christ. Jesus wants to give us something fresh, something new. Um, and we just aren't flexible with what Jesus wants to do. So God wanted to do away with this old garment. He wanted to replace it with a garment of righteousness. I actually told Adayanka uh, his outfit today. I'm like, this reminds me of this verse I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read right now. Um, oh, sorry. Here it is. Well, I forgot to put it in, so I'll just read it, okay? Isaiah 61.10. Isaiah 61.10 uh, tells us this about the new uh, garment that God wants to give us. Um, and it's talking about in, in, in a spiritual way. You know, he's not literally given us a new, you know, clothing or anything like that. But in Isaiah 61, he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with the ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself, with her jewels. And what God's saying, he's saying, hey, listen, I don't want to just patch over this old, miry, uh, mucky garment you have. He says, I want to give you my robes of salvation. Don't rely on your self-righteousness and all the ritualistic rules. Don't rely on me. Trust in my righteousness. Uh, and so now we see he talks about, he knew just, you know, I'm like this. They're stubborn. They're not going to get it. So he's like, okay, let me give you another one. So he talks to them about uh uh, old wineskin. So the containers that they would use for wine back then is you get an animal, they would skin it, they try to keep it all intact, usually goats, and then they would sew it together. Uh, and that new skin would be very strong. It would have the elasticity to be able to stretch because when you put uh, unfermented wine, when you put it inside that um, uh, that skin, it would ferment and fermentation, it expands the gases. So it needed to expand because what would happen after the skin was, was uh, stretched, it was old, time had passed, the skin would become br brittle. It was, wasn't flexible anymore. It was unyielding. It lo lost its ability to expand. And if you took that old wine skin and you filled it with new unfermented wine, it would burst just like Jesus said it would. Uh, the wine would be lost. It would be ineffective at that point for that person. But I just want to encourage all of our hearts this morning that when you choose and you say, no, I just don't want a, a patch over. Uh, no, I, I, I want to give Jesus my whole heart. I want Jesus to have all of me. When you allow Jesus to fill your life, he will change you. He'll make you new. He will never leave you feeling empty. But in fact, he's going to expand your heart. He's going to expand your mind. He's going to renew your mind. He's going with his ability. He's going to expand your ability because his ability is in you with his Holy Spirit. He's going to give you the capacity to have joy and to have love and to have meekness and to have gentleness and to have long suffering and patience like you've never had before because he is in you. And so this is what Jesus wants to do in their lives. He knew that these ritualistic rules are never going to do it. They needed him. They couldn't do it on their own. And if you took that un, uh, old wineskin again and you just try to put that unfermented wine, it's going to burst. So Jesus, he wanted to give, he didn't just want to patch up a sense. Uh, the problem sometimes in my life, all of us, is we say, no, Jesus, I just want you to fix this one thing. There's just this one little tiny thing. I just want you to put a little patch on that. But really keep your hands off of everything else. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. He says, I, I, I want to take uh, um, the oldest passing away, and, and uh, Jesus wants to give them a whole, uh, a whole new life. Jesus wants a whole uh, new you. Over time, even as a believer in Jesus, if you're here and you say, Josh, I know 
Uh, I'm on my way to heaven. I have a relationship with Christ. I've had the forgiveness of my sins through him alone. I've been born again. Well, if I can be honest with you, myself personally, over time, when I'm not practicing the presence of God in my life, my heart can become brittle. My heart can become unyielding. My heart can become resistant to the change that Jesus wants to bring, just like any church can get, just like any religious system can get. And ancient Judaism had definitely gotten that way. Jesus was not patching up, polishing up old Judaism. No, he was coming to fulfill the law, we heard. Part of the law said that a new covenant or a new way was coming. And, uh, the old was passing away because God was bringing about something new. And friends, you, Jesus cannot pour new life into you, his spiritual life into you, into an old, hardened, set in its ways heart or system. Jesus is saying, I can't take my teachings and just pass over, patch over what you're already doing. He says it this way in Ezekiel uh, chapter 36. He says, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Friends, what Jesus wants to do in, all, in, in our city, what he wants to do in our, us personally, what he wants to do with these Pharisees is he wants to take away the old man-made uh, traditional workspace religious teachings. He wanted to say, don't patch over it, get rid of it, and accept my gift of salvation from sin. Jesus was not reviving or reforming uh, something that was old and dead and corrupt. No, he was replacing it. This is a timeless truth. This isn't anything new that I'm talking about today. This is true 2,000 years ago. He was replacing it. His sacrifice on the cross meant that their sins could be forgiven past, present, and future. And their biggest problem, my biggest problem, is my sin is when I want to rely on myself. I want to lie, rely on how good I can be, and I want to rely on my performance rather than trust in Christ and what he's done, rather than trust in his righteousness. There's no amount of keeping the Sabbath and church attendance and tithing, and there's no amount of uh, fasting that can make me righteous before God. Only Jesus can make me righteous before God because only he is righteous. Paul, he said it like this, uh, Paul says, for I through the law, you know, because Jesus fulfilled the law, Jesus is part of this, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God. If the Pharisees were saying this, they're saying, I live by my own merit. I live by what I can do. I live because I'm really good because I fast, because I, I do all these different things. But he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's hope for a Pharisee. That's what Paul used to be. And then he says this at the end. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Paul says, hey, if I can be right with God, if I can be good with God, if I can live this this, this life on my own, then there's no, what was the use for Jesus to die on the cross? He says, I need Christ. I need his grace. I need his robe. I need his righteousness in my life. I want you to see lastly this morning, we've seen that the change Jesus wants us to experience is not rough, a reformed life, but a brand new life, a new heart, uh, not something that he's just patching over, not ritualistic rules, but a real relationship. And then lastly this morning, Jesus wants us to read scripture. He wants us to rely on him. So verse 23 and 24, we, we read this a couple of times this morning. Uh, when it mentions corn, corn was an old English word. It's an old English word, and it was used for any kind of grain. We believe it very likely was barley that these disciples were in, uh, barley fields. Uh, and legally a farmer, so when they say that his, his disciples are not being lawful, they said, man, these guys have broken the law. They weren't saying they were stealing because legally a farmer, you had to leave the corners, the edges of your fields for the widows, uh, for the poor people. You've heard the story of Ruth and even for travelers to come along and to feed themselves to meet their personal uh, daily needs. So this is what the disciples are doing on the Sabbath day. The big problem the Pharisees had was because of the Sabbath. Fasting, Sabbath, that, those are big deals to them. 
and, and they had violated a very long list of their do's and don'ts that they had for the Sabbath day. You see, the Bible it was very simple. It was very clear to the commands that God gave to the Jews about the Sabbath. And Deuteronomy 23, 25, I won't read it, but pretty much what God was saying, he was saying it's okay to pluck heads of grain. It's okay to do that on the Sabbath as long as you don't bring like this far sickle and you just cut a bunch and you start farming and you know, you're just really working. He says, but if you're just plucking it for yourself, that wasn't considered work. If you're just trying to feed yourself and, and satisfy a personal daily need, God said, you can, you're totally permitted to do that. He said, you know, you can go to a vineyard and you can pluck grapes, but don't bring a massive basket and fill that up and go to the market and sell it on the Sabbath. So that's what Jesus, but, uh, you know, that's, this is the context here as they're challenging him. So they didn't break God's word. They were following God's word perfectly. But the Pharisees, though, we've heard this uh, the past few weeks, they made something called the oral Torah or the, or the mikvah, I believe, and, and they would, uh, it was books written about God's word, books written about the law, and they were very, very difficult to obey, very, very difficult to follow, very complicated. For the Sabbath, they made 39 extra rules that you had to follow. So God just made a, a few. They said, oh, let us add 39 extra ones uh, to really get you to understand what God wants. So Jesus' disciples had broken at least four of them on the Sabbath. The first one is, you know, you could not reap on the Sabbath, the Pharisees said. You're not allowed to reap. They said you're not allowed to thresh uh, grain. You're not allowed to winnow grain. And you're not allowed to prepare food. Well, what did the disciples do if we were to read it um, again in verse, uh, uh, in verse 23 and 24? Well, the disciples... Uh, they plucked. And so the, the Pharisees would say, are you plucked? Well, that means you're reaping. And then they rubbed the grain with their hands. Uh, so that means you're threshing. And then they would blow the chaff off the wheat. That means you're winnowing. So you broke three. And then what did they do? They ate it. You prepared a meal. So they broke four. Man, man, my head would just be wrecked every weekend. You know, it's supposed to be a day of rest. But, I mean, I would have to have a whole day of hard work before the Sabbath on the day after the Sabbath to rest from the day of rest. They made it very complicated and very hard work to keep the Sabbath. The disciples, they had not broken God's word. They had not displeased God. They had only broken man-made tradition. And so verse 25 and 26, Jesus asks a question that I need to ask myself quite a bit. This is when I get in trouble, is when I don't ask myself this question. This is, if you're honest, this is when you get yourself into trouble. This is why the Pharisees were confused. He says, have you not read? Have you not read God's word? You, you must not have. You're not looking to God's word. You're looking to this extra biblical things. You're looking to man-made things. Have you not read? It's very important for us to know what the Bible says. And 1 Samuel 21 is what he's referencing. And he talks about David eating the showbread and the priest giving it to them. And it was not lawful. See, David, he's on the run from King Saul. King Saul is hunting him down. Uh, he is in exile. Saul knows David is supposed to be the king. Samuel says, David is a man after God's own heart, and God is taking the kingdom, uh, 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 is departing from you. So David runs to a village called Nob. He meets Abimelech, the high priest, and he says, Abimelech, I am starving. My men are starving. Do you have anything to eat? And uh, 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 Abimelech says, well, we do have the showbread but it's like this holy bread that only the priests are able to eat. And David says, well, hey, have you like consecrated it? Have you like prayed over it? Have you blessed it yet? You know, and he's like, well, no, we haven't. He says, well, you think there might be some moving room where we can eat it? And so Abimelech says, well, you know, there's some ceremonial law. You know, have you kept yourself uh, from ladies? He says, yeah, for three days you've been on the run. So he says, okay, you can eat it. So David and his men, technically they weren't supposed to eat it, but they ate it. And they ate the showbread. And uh, Abimelech allows this to happen, the priest. So none of his men were priests. But, so David and his men, they violated a religious law. But God saw their human need. He, God saw what they needed. And friends, Jesus shows us that he values our genuine, our genuine, that's a key word, our real human needs, more than he does ritual observance. Um. A verse that I grew up hearing all the time, and it's a good one. It's a good one to remind yourself. Uh, 
Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, uh, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And so we see in the New Testament, you know, Sunday is similar to the Sabbath for, for Bible-believing Christians. Uh, the church, there's, we're not Israel, you know, we're different, but uh, you could say there's similarities to what they did in the synagogue as they prayed, they studied scripture, they sang, they fellowshiped. And we see all over the New Testament that the local church is mentioned a lot. Most of the letters in the New Testament are written to church, so we know that's very important to God, isn't it? And we know the believers, they, they met together a lot to do very, very similar to what we do here at DBF. So we know that this is important to God. We know Jesus and his disciples, uh, they were in synagogue a lot. Uh, but can I just say this this morning, just to apply it? to make to, uh, Jesus understands when we're sick and we can't make it to church. He sees the human need more than he sees trying to follow this, this command. Uh, Jesus understands uh, when there's a shut-in, when someone, their health has failed them and they can't make it. He understands that. Jesus even understands it when someone, they know, man, if I, uh, if, if I don't go to work, I'm going to lose my job. I, I don't know how I'm going to provide for my family. Jesus sees that. He understands that. Um, and some people will say, oh, it's risky to say that, Josh. But I will say this. It, he sees genuine needs, doesn't he? Sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes uh, what Jesus is not okay with is when we're not assembling, when we're not trying to honor uh, his day because we're having a long lie-in, okay? <laughs> or because we're, we're just enjoying, you know, YouTube or personal entertainment or something like that. Uh, so that's not what God's saying here. But God sees genuine human needs, doesn't he? He understands that. He sees the, the spirit of the command, not just the letter of the law, the letter of the command. But I want you to see uh, just one last point here in verse 27 and 28. He says, Jesus is uh, the Lord of the Sabbath. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath was not made for man, uh, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So Jesus Christ, he's saying, I have more authority over the Sabbath than man-made Sabbath laws have over the Jewish people. I have more authority over it. And perhaps in your life, you'd say, you know, there's some things I'm having a hard time letting go of. I know Jesus wants me to let go of some things. There's some practices or some things in my heart. There's some things in my mind that he wants me to recalibrate and change. I'm resisting uh, him. And we need to say, I want to rely on scripture. Have I read? I want to rely on what God says. I want to rely on what Jesus is saying in my, into my life. Jesus' authority should always supersede our man-made traditions. We need to trust in him. Is Jesus in charge of your Sunday? Is he the Lord of your Sunday? Is he the Lord of your Monday? Is he the Lord of your every day? Is he the Lord of your, your Wednesday? Our community, our city, our world needs to be exposed to God's word. Not to what we have to say, but what does God say? What does Jesus say? They need to be exposed to people that have trusted in Jesus Christ alone, uh, that know his word, that try to live it through his help because they've experienced the new life that Jesus gives. I just want you to consider your life quickly this morning. Have you let Jesus change your thoughts? Are you letting Jesus change your heart, desires? Are you letting Jesus expand uh, your heart, taking a heart of stone and making a heart of flesh. Have you let Jesus do that for you? Letting Jesus determine the way that you know God. Or can your heart sometimes be, I can know my heart can sometimes be like this, be like an old, dried up, inflexible, unmovable wine skin. Or is it new? What does God want to change in your life and my life? Just one last quick story. Um, many of you know I grew up in Sri Lanka for several years. My parents were missionaries there. And Sri Lanka would be a Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist, very fundamental version of Buddhism, uh, Islam, Hindu. And what oftentimes would happen when someone would profess faith in Christ, it would be very difficult for people. And sometimes there would be some confusion. 
And sometimes what would happen is someone would have the Hindu idols and they'd say, you know what, I prayed and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But yet, in their taxi, in their trishaw, in their home, they would just have Jesus there with the rest. They just used Jesus kind of as an add-on, as a patch. And they're trying to put new life into something old, an old system that they were living by. And eventually, you know, they, 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 it just didn't work, did it? It, it wouldn't work for them. But when we really knew someone truly experienced new life and trusted in Christ, when, when something like this would happen. You see, we, we, would, we wanted the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't want to be like the Pharisees and just, you know, be on people's case. We wanted God to work in people's life. So we would pray for people as they made a profession of faith in Christ. And when we knew when people had that genuine belief and trust in Jesus alone is I remember there was a lady and she called my dad and she says, she said, Mr. Matthew, she said, um, she said, now that Jesus is my God and my Lord, she said, I have this place in my house with my incense with my, my Buddhas and different things there. And she said, I would like you to come and can you take those away? She said, I don't want them anymore. She never heard anybody, any Christian, tell her she had to do that. But she just knew, I, I put my faith in Christ, and he's my God. It's him. I'm not, I, he's not just a patch. He's not just an add-on. He's not just an extra. I, he's going to give me a new heart, a new life. And that happened over and over again where people, the light bulb would turn on. And friends, perhaps like that lady, perhaps maybe it's not a, not a Buddha or something like that. But maybe you can pinpoint, if you examine your heart, you examine your mind this morning, you could say, if you're, maybe you haven't trusted Christ for salvation, you say, you know what, there's something holding me back from looking to him alone. Maybe it's old religious teachings that don't line up with God's word. Maybe it's just our own personal desires in our heart that was something we want, and it's just holding us back. Jesus wants to come in. He wants to expand that heart. He wants to expand that mind the new life that he brings. Maybe as a believer, you would say, Josh, you know, I definitely have something like that. I know I have a relationship with Jesus. I know my sins are forgiven, but there is definitely some rubbish in my life, you know, that I need to clear out. I need to get rid of my, my thing. And I need to experience the newness that Jesus wants to bring in my life. We're going to pray now. And I want to challenge you. If that's you and you'd say today, you know, maybe even online, you would say, I've never trusted Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't know if I were to die today, I would go to heaven. I, I, I try to be a good person, but is there a way I can know? Is there a way that can have my sins forgiven? I can know Jesus Christ. I can know God personally. And if that's you, please reach out to us. We'd love to show you from God's word that he loves us. We're sinners. We need to repent of our sin and trust in what Jesus has done on the cross. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when we cry out to Jesus with that heart of faith, Jesus will make us brand new. So let's pray now, and uh, we'll go to our announcements. Lord, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we're so thankful that we can know you personally. We're so thankful um, just for these words you give us today. Lord, we... we it can't be said of us that we don't know that we haven't read. We're thankful for the privilege we have to be uh, in this city where we're exposed to your word. Thank you for the desire you put in our hearts to be here, for the opportunity you've given in, uh, to us to even daily uh, to be able to personally on our own go to your word and to talk to you. So Lord, we just pray that uh, you would do a work that we can't do. Lord, if there's someone they've not trusted in you, uh, for the forgiveness of their sin. They're relying on themselves. They're relying on another system. Lord, I pray you would be able to help them make that decision to trust in you alone. Lord, I pray for those of us, we have believed, we have trusted in you. We are relying on you for salvation. Lord, I, I'm on, I'll be honest with you. Um, I know there's things in my heart, there's things in my life I need you uh, not just to patch over. I just need you to take it completely away. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to experience and to demonstrate the fruit of your spirit in our life, to be people that are marked by joy, uh, marked by gentleness, marked by meekness, um, people that are marked by knowing you, having a relationship with you. Lord, help. we desire for you to be the Lord of every day, of tomorrow, of every day this week in our life. 
pray, say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, just a few quick announcements for us. Um, some Tonight at Grove Place, we, we've had uh, some uh, new people join us uh, with this. Um, we're having a discipleship class. We only have two more lessons uh, left. And discipleship, it's not really lessons. You know, it's you can be a disciple uh, uh, in a lot of different ways, just continuing in God's word. But this is just something that helps us in that. Uh, so you're always welcome to come along. We're going to probably be starting another one at the beginning of next year. Uh, but we also do it one-on-one. Uh, we're doing it one-on-one with a, with a couple of people right now. Uh, and then on Tuesdays, we're going verse by verse. Uh, through Revelation, where we we have an extended time of prayer, um, and so even if uh, if you ever just have a prayer request, even if it's unspoken, you just say, "I just need prayer." Uh, you don't even have to let us know the details. Uh, let us know because that is a time we dedicate uh, to really praying before the Bible study. Um, and then next Sunday, Lord willing, uh, we have a candidate for someone who desires to be baptized, um, and so that is going to take place. At our house um, in, on Knightsbridge at 7 p.m. on next Sunday night. So everyone's welcome. We'd love to have you come if you're if, if you're able. We might have some sandwiches and and different things. Um, and so you're very welcome to come along to that. Uh, and then uh, in a couple more weeks, we're going to have a youth event. If you know any teens you think might be interested in this, uh, let us know. Uh, we're going to um, have a time there. And then um, it's not next Sunday, or it, it, actually I think it is. Next Sunday, yes. Uh, Declan Flanagan, he's a pastor up in Swords, Dublin. Um, and so he's going to be speaking for us. Um, and then Ladies Bible Study. I think there's going to be some changes to that. Bethany's trying to come up with a different uh, idea. And so that might change a little bit. And so we'll let you know um, about that. But now if you'd stand with me, we're going to just sing one uh, last song. Jesus, he paid it all. We don't have to pay it for ourselves. Jesus paid it for us. Jesus, he paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed in white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Brian, would you be able to pray, dismiss us in prayer? And then we have some tea and uh, biscuits and thank you Cameron he, he's really gotten hooked on the biscuits so he went to the store he, he's like wow these are the only ones and he found some really good ones for us so we'll enjoy those after